Okay, cool. All right, so chapter one, yesterday, and there should be a book somewhere. Oh, you got it. Okay, cool. The only part we probably got through was very gray. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's setting us up to see these folks, this community as very like somber, without color, gray, brown, like everything's rusted and, you know, antiqued, even though at the point of the setting, it's Boston around 1650. So actually, you might wanna make a note of this, by the way, the crucible was set in Salem in 1692. The Scarlet Letter predates that in terms of its setting. It is set around 1650 in Boston. So it's a really new territory. It's a really new civilization, okay? Because remember the um, Puritans came over in like 1630. So they haven't been settled there for very long, but their buildings and things look aged and antique, like they've been there a long, long time. On this otherwise really kind of dreary background, we have a rose bush. So go to the end of the chapter, and it's only like a page and a half long. So that is a blessing, because Hawthorne's tough to get through. So if you have a chapter that's a page and a half long, that's probably a good thing, right? So at the end, he talks about this rose bush that grows beside the prison door. And he says something like, maybe it's nature's way of saying that it sympathizes with humanity. Because it's growing outside the prison door. Who comes in and out of the prison? The people who have what? Um, yeah, committed crimes maybe done bad things, but you got to also keep in mind, this is a society where sin equates crime. Okay, so for instance, and I think I told y'all this yesterday, our protagonist is a woman named Hester Prynne. She's beautiful. She's young. She's probably like mid-20s. We're going to find out that the marriage that she was a part of was an arranged marriage and her husband is much older. Not only that, but he's been missing for like two years. So she presumes he's dead. But when she winds up pregnant, everybody knows she has sinned. Now folks, that is something, if it happened today, people might talk about it, right? But you wouldn't be thrown into jail for it but this is a Puritan environment and sin equates crime, okay? Um, before I move a little bit further on, recall that there are two things that Hawthorne says always have to be made when you start a new like society. Cemetery, cemetery and, a prison. and a prison. So he has this really kind of pessimistic outlook and we know there's some backstory to this. Why is Hawthorne haunted by the whole idea of Puritanism? What's personal about it? Because his family was kind of just jerks. Yeah, they were. They were like the ugly Puritans, right? The ones that are intolerant and wanting to punish. Um, in fact, it's his great, great, I think great-grandfather, who was the hang, no, I'm wrong. Great-great-grandfather, who was the hanging judge that we know from the crucible. Names spelled differently because somewhere along the line they wanted to say, oh yeah, that's not us, that's those other Hawthorns. Of course, it didn't fool anybody, right? Um, so, two things you gotta have set up, prison, cemetery. People won't die, they're gonna commit crimes or sins, okay? And at the end, you have this rose bush. Well, you might want to jot this down too, okay? So the rose bush is this spot of beauty and color on an otherwise really bleak landscape. And we're going to find out that Hester Prynne is this beautiful, remarkable young woman who does not blend into the pack. So she is symbolized by the rose.
okay? In fact, when we get in to chapter two, we have all these people, what really the whole village has turned out because uh, they are surrounding the prison because on this morning, the prisoner is going to come out of the prison and they wanna be there to see it. Guys, public humiliation was a thing. It was not just a way to like correct someone but it was, it was entertainment. So you have people coming out because they're bored and they want to pass a, a good time. And their way of doing that is to see this person who is publicly shamed. And Hester is gonna have to go out there holding her infant because her infant was actually born in prison, okay? And they're gonna see how she reacts to all this. And that's really where we pick up with chapter two. Okay, so let me grab chapter two. All right, I'm gonna skip ahead in two for a little bit. Now look guys, when I read out loud and explain stuff, and I will be doing a lot of that because this book's tough, don't let that be the only time you open your book because y'all have got to be working on this at home as well, okay? All right, so I'm gonna skip, let's see, one, about three page, uh, not three pages, sorry, three paragraphs to where we have some dialogue. The book gets good when we have dialogue, okay? And it says, good wives set a hard featured dame of 50. You guys see that? Okay, uh, chapter two, maybe three paragraphs in, okay? Good wives set a hard damed Hard featured Dame of 50, and I have to say while y'all are finding this, I used to think 50 was old, now I'm 50. Guess what, doesn't seem as old as it used to. Good wife said a hard featured Dame of 50, I'll tell you a piece of my mind. It would be greatly for the public behoof if we women, being of mature age and church members in good repute, should have the handling of such malefactresses as this Hester Prynne. Malefactress is someone who sins, okay? So they say, the women should be in charge of her punishment. What think, ye gossips? And she calls her women friends gossips. That's probably not a good thing, right? What think, ye gossips, if the hussy stood up for the judgment before us five that are now here and not together? Would she come off with such a sentence as the worshipful magistrates of awarded Mary? I trow not. People say, said another, that the Reverend Master Denzel, her godly pastor, takes it very grievously to heart that such a scandal should have come upon his congregation. Probably want to highlight that part too, because we find out that the women are really judgy. They're more judgy than the men are. They would love to get their hands on her, okay? And we also find out that her affair with whomever, because she's not talking about who the dad is, is quite the scandal, especially within her church, okay? The magistrates are God-fearing gentlemen, but merciful over much. That is a truth, added a third autumnal matron. At the very least, they should have put the brand of a hot iron on Hester Prynne's forehead. Madam Hester would have winced at that, I warrant me, but she, the naughty baggage. Little will she care what they put upon the bodice of her gown, why, look you, she may cover it with a brooch or such other like heathenish adornment and walk the streets as brave as ever. Ah, keep highlighting, but, but interposed more softly a young wife holding a child by the hand. Let her cover the mark as she will. The pang of it will always be in her heart. And that's going to end up being foreshadowing because Hester really does physically feel the weight of the letter A that is attached to the bosom of her gown, okay? But the first women that speak think she's getting off too easily. Why do they want her just to put like the letter A on her clothes? She could cover that up, right? It would be better if they did what? Branded her. Yeah, wow, pretty vicious, okay? But that was common. I think I told y'all that yesterday. I mean, folks that committed crimes, um, sin or whatnot, were often branded. So they'd have to wear that mark for life. And it wouldn't be branded where they couldn't see it either. It'd be like on your forehead or on your hands, okay? So um, 
They think she's getting off a little too easily, right? But one sympathetic voice, a young mother says she'll always feel it on her heart, okay? All right, now they're gonna go on and on and talk about how, you know, she's brought shame on all of the women in the community and that she really just should be put to death. And finally, finally, they hush up because the woman herself is about to come out of the prison, okay? Now, skip down a couple of paragraphs to where it says the door of the jail. You guys see it? Yes. Okay. The door of the jail being flung open from within, there appeared in the first place like a black shadow emerging in the sun, the grim, grisly presence of the town beetle. Now, you may want to put a little side note. That means he's like the sheriff. He is the law, okay? With a sword by his side and a staff of office in his hand, this personage prefigured and presented in his aspect the whole dismal severity of the Puritanic code of law, which it was his business to administer. Stretching forth the official staff in his left hand, he laid his right upon the shoulder of a young woman, whom he thus drew forward, highlight all this, until on the threshold of the prison door, she repelled him by an action marked with natural dignity and force of character and stepped into the open air as if by her own free will. Okay, so if you can imagine this, we've got the town, you know, sheriff, right? And he is going to put his hand on the shoulder of this woman who, by the way, has been in prison for months because when she showed signs of being pregnant, they started to question her. Who is the father? I mean, your husband's been gone for years, so we know you've committed adultery. Who is your partner in sin, right? And she won't talk. She gives them nothing. And when that happens, they toss her into prison, and she's there not only until she delivers the child, because the child was born in prison, but for a few months after. And so the, it's going to talk about how the infant sees the sun for the first time. You know, it blinks in the brightness of the sun because it has all, it's lived its entire existence in a dark place. Okay, so here's the sheriff. He puts his arm or his hand on her shoulder to guide her over the threshold into the light. And what does she do? Look at her behavior. She pushes it away. She repels him and steps out by herself, which I think is incredibly important when you think about her character. What does that tell her or tell us about her character? She Could be, yeah, she doesn't want, I don't think she wants them to know that she is She's a strong hurting, yeah. She's a strong she wants to show strength. They pride, like, I'm not, you're not going to have to guide me out here. I can do this on my own, right? If I'm going to face the shame, I'm going to own up to it and, and walk out there under my own power. So it shows a strength, kind of a stubbornness. I don't think she wants them to know how she's really feeling. Part of her punishment, by the way, is to stand on what's called the scaffold, and that would be a stage. But you don't want to be on the stage. It's a bad stage. It's like the gibbet in the crucible, okay? She's gonna have to stand before her former friends and neighbors. Like these are folks that she went to church with. These are folks that have been good to her up to this point. And she's gonna have to stand there holding that child for three hours as they just kind of look at her and, you know, of course judge her and such, right? And it's gonna hurt her, but she doesn't want them to know how it affects her. So it's a very human response. You know, if you're if, if you're put in a situation like, oh, God help us, let's hope not, but if we're ever put in a situation where we are ashamed and you know stood in front of an audience of our peers, I think I would, um, I hope I wouldn't just crumble. I hope I would have enough strength to like hold it together, you know? She's gonna be able to hold it together. Like not, um, not screw up. Yes. Yeah. It's like she's gonna put up a front for three hours. Yeah. I know. And actually, that's a good question, Hadley, or a good comment because as you finish reading chapter two, you're gonna have to read the rest of it on your own. At the end of the chapter, kind of like 
we would probably do if we were in that situation. She's standing up there and it's telling us what she's thinking. And she's thinking thoughts like, how did I get here, <laughs> right? What led me to this point? Where did I go wrong? She's gonna talk about like, or think about her childhood and her young adulthood and then get to the point where she is here and it's just kind of baffling, you know? Um, all right, so a little bit more. Highlight all this as well. This is super important. Let's see. Hmm. She bore in her arms a child, a baby of some three months old, who winked and turned aside its little face from the too vivid light of day because its existence heretofore had brought it acquainted only with the gray twilight of the dungeon. When the young woman, the mother of this child, stood fully revealed before the crowd, it seemed to be her first impulse to clasp the infant closely to her bosom. Not so much by an impulse of motherly affection as that she might thereby conceal a certain token which was wrought or fastened into her dress. In a moment, however, wisely judging that one token of her shame would but poorly serve to hide, it, hide another, she took the baby on her arm with a burning blush and a haughty smile and a glance that would not be abashed, would not be crushed, looked around at her town's people and neighbors. Okay, so her first instinct is to take the baby and do what with it? Hold it, hold it. Hold it so that it is covering the, letter. covering the letter. But what does she realize? This is key. She's like, this, they're the same. They're the same thing. You can't use one token of your shame to hide the other. This is the first time that the baby and the letter are tied together, but they're gonna be tied together throughout the entire novel. In other words, she can't deny her sin because her child is like the living embodiment of that sin. Y'all get that? That makes sense? Yeah. What's that? What's like, is, are they gonna kill like the child? No. Okay. No, but there is gonna be a point where they decide that maybe it would be best if they took the child away from her and she fights like hell, basically to, to yeah. keep that child, okay? No, they're both ostracized. And y'all you know what that means, ostracized? Mm -hmm. Basically cast out. They're not, a, they're not welcome, they're not a, like a welcome part of the community anymore. And Hester uh, Prynne, the mother, is very purposely going to find a place to live that's on the outskirts of that society. Because she's been cast out, but truly, she doesn't really want to be a part of them anymore because those are not the nicest people. So it gives her kind of a sense of independence too. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Tonight, y'all are going to need to finish reading chapter two so that we can talk a little bit more and I can get you into three. Um, and again, I cannot talk about every single thing, even if I wanted to, because I don't have that kind of time. So you have to put your time into it at home. Um, right now, though, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Yesterday, I gave you a poem that was called The Author to Her Book, and it is by Ann Bradstreet. I need you to take it out. You're gonna spend the rest of the hour basically explicating this poem. And y'all, explicating is just a fancy word of saying explain. You're gonna take it like a line at a time or maybe an idea at a time and put it in your own words, okay? And um, basically get to the heart of this poem. This is a poem that I usually do a Socratic seminar on, but we can't physically move into circles to do a Socratic seminar. So we're gonna discuss it, but I need y'all to be fully prepared. So tomorrow I might do like a real quick check and get y'all to hold your papers up. And if there's not like writing all over it, I may take points away from you. Okay, so you need to like dig in. Here is a hint, eyeballs up. This is Ann Bradstreet. Remember her first collection of poems? How were they published? by her brother-in-law that she didn't even know about it till they already had been published and people had started to kind of comment on them, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to keep that in the back of your mind because the title is the author to her book. The book is like her collection of poems, but what you're going to see is that this poem works on two levels. It could be a mother talking to her child 
okay? But it's really an author talking to her work that she feels like she's like, you know, given birth to. Does that make sense? Okay, look up words you don't know, mark it up, and um, try to finish it before you go home so you don't have any of that to do. You just can work with scarlet letters tonight, okay? Everybody's got a copy of the plot or the um, poem? Mm -hmm. Good job. Get to it. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Assignments on Canvas, so basically we have... Yeah, if you have it on Canvas, I'm sorry. I don't know why I took my glasses off. These are my real glasses, not my readers. Okay, so um, you don't have... My virtual kids have to do it on Canvas. Okay. Canvas, because that's proof that they're keeping up. But I see you doing it, and I will check on y'all tomorrow. Okay. So, okay? Yeah. So, really, homework for me is getting through the SCART letter right now. Okay? Okay. 